What's going on, y'all? Back with another topic of discussion for you guys. Um, first of all, thank you so much for all the comments on last week's video. I read through all of them. You guys had some really great and thoughtful points. I uh, appreciate every single comment. Um, even, you know, if we don't all agree with them, I love that open discussion that we're starting to build with this series, and I hope it continues. And uh, this week's topic is something that's been rattling around in my brain uh, that I'm sure a lot more of the older DJs can kind of sympathize with. I don't know if that's the right word, uh, rather than the new DJs, um, because it's more of uh, the norm with the newer generation of DJs. Um, and it's the fact that DJs don't, or DJs can't just be DJs. You have to be a DJ, promoter, graphic designer, content creator, producer, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and in the past, you know, uh, ever since I started gigging, um, DJs have had to at least be able to promote their parties. I mean, duh, you want people to show up. Um, as the years went on, it became more and more so how many people you bring to the party. Um, I can give a personal story on that is that um, for a, a while, in uh, LA, um, there were events where the DJs would get booked based on if they could sell a certain number of tickets. And if the tickets didn't get sold, the DJ had to eat the cost of all of those tickets. Meaning, it's basically pay to play, right? Either the person, the DJ is selling the tickets you know, making the promoter, whoever's throwing the event money, or if the DJ wants to play and he doesn't have the network or the social skills or whatever you want to call it, the promotion skills, or he's too introverted, um, that he'd have to, you know, pay for all of those tickets and, and then maybe play. Pretty much playing for not only, not just for free, but for a loss because you're paying for the tickets. Um, seeing those kind of events pop up, um, I kind of shied away from those. Um, I'm not going to be dishonest. I, I did a few of them uh, early, early on. I wouldn't necessarily say I got taken advantage of because it taught me a lot about the game. It taught me a lot about what kind of events I wanted to do and which ones I wasn't comfortable doing. And mostly it broke down to me being more introverted um, still to this day, giant introvert, uh, and also just not having the networking skills at that point in my career. Um, and that's kind of where this spawned off of is, uh, last week's discussion was about not skills, not being paramount, but your network being paramount. And that was a, a big, um, example of that, right? Where if my network was big and I sold a bunch of tickets, I'd, you know, make a okay amount playing. But for a DJ like me, who's especially early on, whose network wasn't that big, who wasn't that comfortable hitting up people to come out, um, it just didn't work out for me. Um, I found other events and other parties that I fit more into and I was more comfortable being a part of. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm happy with my DJ journey and all the, you know, W's and L's I've taken in this game, um, in my, during my career. Um, but that was just the beginning, right? Where the DJ not only had to be the DJ, but he also had to be the promoter for the party. Um, especially one of my first residencies, actually, I guess you would say my first residency, um, in LA at a old spot called Mountain Bar. Shout out to them, now called General Lee's. Um, many, many great nights spent in that venue. Um, but having that be my first residency, I we were throwing our own party. It was me and I think three or four other DJs. Uh, ooh, three other DJs. Three, four, yeah. <laughs> Three other DJs plus myself, and then we'd bring in guests sometimes, or I'd bring in guests, um, as you know, you know, 
the party went on and we got a bigger budget and et cetera. I'd pay them out of my own pocket. Um, but because it was my event, I felt more invested in kind of promoting the party. Also, at that time, I've been DJing for a little bit longer and uh, starting to build my network and getting those people to come out, college friends, etc. And the nights were successful. Um, it gave me the confidence to want to do it more. Um, you know, it gave me confidence in my DJ ability, gave me more confidence in my ability to network, etc. Um, but that was just the beginning, right? Now, with the advent of social media, uh, the promotion side has gone away from just in person or text message or phone call to creating content for uh, social media for Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, wherever you're posting content, right? And that's not for everybody. And, you know, it doesn't have to be for everybody. Um, I've DJed with huge people on socials that aren't that great. I've DJed with people that or really have a super small following that are very, very good DJs. Um, but, you know, the market is the market and you kind of have to play by those rules, right? If, again, this is only if you want this to be your career or you want to do this full time. Um, and in, in some ways, that's kind of how this YouTube channel was born, right? Uh, I was, when, when did I start this channel? <laughs> many, many years ago. Um, actually, I guess the channel started right before I left LA, uh, but I was just kind of posting whatever videos. Um, <laughs> actually, if you go back way, way back, um, uh, my first videos were just me going to parties in LA or shows and taking long videos on my iPhone, just holding it up, going to like, uh, hard summer and just like different smaller parties or whatever concerts and taking videos of shows and posting them up on uh, YouTube. Very much so inspired by uh, Glenn Jammin, um, legendary LA photographer, videographer. Um, I say this all the time. Uh, if I was at a party that Glenn was at, I knew that I was at the right party. And I would see his videos, I would watch his videos uh, like religiously because he would post all the time and I wanted to do that. I wanted to like document that part of, um, I guess that, that part, that time in music in LA, uh, much like he was doing. But as I moved out of LA and, um, moved to Vegas full time, I had a lot more time on my hands because I didn't have a nine to five job and I had to think of, um, you know, things to do with my time. And also I had to think of a way to market myself other than just my DJing. Because I moved to a new city, I didn't know many people here when I got here. Um, my network was very small and I had to kind of start over again. Uh, this was, I don't want to say a bigger DJ market, but this was a more condensed DJ market than uh, what I experienced in LA. Um, now my LA DJ experience was never at the highest level, um, but here I was, you know, getting into rooms with some of the biggest DJs in the world, um, open format and otherwise. And um, while, you know, I, my introvertedness made me feel like the outsider and, uh, you know, kind of getting over that awkwardness of talking to new people, um, I still had a lot of time on my hands because a lot of that stuff happened at night, uh, nightclubs. Uh, so I started posting tutorials and I thought, hmm, you know, I love teaching. I love helping people out. Uh, I love the geeky technical side of DJing. Maybe this is my niche and this is where I can add value to my DJing. Um, so I started creating content and this is kind of before, I guess, you know, this is like before Instagram video or like right at the beginning where it wasn't as paramount. And I definitely saw a, a an ROI on me creating content. I was getting recognized by other DJs, you know, people like that I looked up to or newer DJs like, yo, you're a uh, PDOT from YouTube, right? You know, it was a nice warm introduction to like get to know more people. And it really helped me out that way. Um, throughout the years, 
of me having this YouTube channel, I've definitely met people for the first time that have, on multiple occasions, I'm like, yo, you're P.Dot from YouTube. What's up, man? Nice to meet you. You've helped me out a lot. And first and foremost, that's super humbling. Um, anybody that watches my content, thank you. And of course, I'm glad that my content's more focused on helping other people. Um, and that's always like, you know, the mission of this channel. But at the same time, I got value out of that because it was a warm introduction and allowed me to feel a little bit easier, felt easier to talk to people, felt it kind of brought my wall, my introverted walls down and allowed me to talk to people. And now as time has progressed and we are deep, deep into the social media age, uh, especially over pandemic, can I say that on YouTube? I don't know. Uh, anyways, over the panini and having TikTok kind of take off and DJs staying at home, we saw the rise of a new kind of uh, DJ content. And it, the people that really invested into that, um, hats off to you guys. Uh, they did. There's some people that were super unknown and blew up because of what they were able to create and the community that they were able to create on their social media platforms during that time and all the way up to today. Um, there's definitely people that have blown up and gotten gigs at huge clubs around the world and throw their own events that sell out. Oh, <laughs> and it's a wonderful thing to see, but also for a lot of DJs out there that just don't have that content bug in them. Do you feel left behind? I know that it took me a while to start really posting daily or multiple times a week on my Instagram. And when I finally did, it was only after I figured out how to make that work for me. And I think that's the number one thing, right? If content is forced, it's going to come out in that content one way or the other. Either you're going to burn out because you hate doing it or it's not going to be 100% genuine and it's, there's going to be some disconnect there. And not until I was able to figure out how to make, you know, vertical video, one minute videos, TikToks, IG reels that fit my style, which is teaching and helping and being able to condense that into a minute, was I able to kind of get the ball rolling as far as that kind of content is concerned. And to be honest, to me, that was harder in, in a lot of ways. It was it's harder than making longer form content like these YouTube videos because you're only constrained to 90 seconds, 60 seconds of time to get your message across. And I know that <coughs> there was a lot of older DJs, especially, you know, a year or two ago, right after um, clubs reopened, that were kind of clowning on a lot of these social media DJs that were doing, you know, just simple blends, simple transitions and, you know, making faces and, or whatever the case is. I don't know. Um, but it's just not only generationally, is there a difference in like the mindset of who's comfortable in front of a camera or who's comfortable presenting themselves in a certain light. Uh, but especially in the hip hop, you know, open format DJ world where it comes from a culture of really strict, if you go all the way back, really strict like laws and regulations of, you know, competing to be the best and um, the whole battle culture of hip hop, right? Um, you carry yourself in a certain way. Uh, you're a little bit more serious. And that kind of mindset, and it's, um, you know, a mindset deep down inside that I had too, right? I... I started DJing because I wanted to be a turntablist. I wanted to cut the best. I wanted to juggle, et cetera, et cetera. So that's like, I get that part of it. Um, but also, if you're looking at the business side of it, if these people that are making this content and putting the effort in are doing it and aren't necessarily biting other people, which is the number one rule in hip hop, you don't bite, right? Um, is it really that bad? Um, it's like 
for every DJ that put out a, a bunch of content and got more exposure and because of that was able to get more gigs <coughs> rather than the more traditional DJs that don't really mess with social media like that or don't really make content for social media as part of their promotion, getting not getting the gigs. Like, that's just part of the game, right? Um, to me, especially this being my livelihood, like, I completely get it. You know what I mean? I completely get the fact that if that's the route you went and you put in the effort to make that content, maybe I'm a little bit more, um, what's the word? I'm a little more sympathetic because, or empathetic, which one is it? Uh, that, because I make content and I've been doing it for a long time in some capacity or another, DJ related, um, that I get it, you know, they put themselves out, those DJs, those younger, mostly younger DJs put themselves out there, got the, re the response and the comments and likes and all that stuff, the clout, whatever you want to call it, from social media, and was able to turn that into more opportunities for them to actually showcase their skills or lack thereof in some in some instances um then you know good on them if that's what the market dictates and that's what bookers and managers and people giving these people shots are looking for because again going back to all the way back to what i, I was originally talking about in la it's like it breaks down to how many tickets can you sell right and though those tickets are kind of like a the same thing as how many followers do you have or like, you know, how, how many people are talking about the content that you make. Now, of course, in the middle of that, there was a lot of DJs that were buying followers, buying um, con or comments and all that stuff. And a lot of bookers found out the hard way that, you know, at least early on Instagram days that follower, sh follower count doesn't necessarily mean bodies in the building. But when you're making content and people are commenting on it and reposting it and you're seeing it over and over again and you're seeing other people that you follow repost the content and you're seeing it all over your, your timeline from multiple people that you follow, that has a little bit more value than the fake followership that bookers and uh, venue owners were using before, right? <coughs> and maybe, I just thought of this, maybe that's why a lot of the older DJs kind of have that bad taste in their mouth about it because they saw that rise of DJs that just bought followers and when they got behind the decks, they sucked. It's, it can kind of be similar. Um, I've, you know, I've heard stories uh, of those DJs that made a bunch of content in the last few years, like short form content, not being able to like hold a room because they never really had to hold a room before. Maybe this is their first year of gigging out. Maybe this is their second year of gigging out and getting in front of people. And that's a skill you learn over time, right? And I, I get it. Those people getting those opportunities over someone that's seasoned that can hold a room. There's always going to be value in being that older DJ or being that, and I shouldn't say older, but being that seasoned, experienced DJ that knows how to read a room, knows how to work a room. But if you're not able to promote yourself in the way that people can see it which in this day and age is social media and short form video or long form video um then how are they going to know that you're experienced and seasoned and can hold a room right if these people are popping and these people are getting the attention of so many more people a lot of people that aren't really die hard dj fans or die hard in the culture they're going to look for oh i see that person a lot and they seem to be posting stuff that people are interested in I'm going to go that way because in their mind, that makes sense, right? Because you can see it. You can see the reaction from people posting or commenting, liking, reposting, etc. But there is still value or how can I put this? It still takes a DJ plenty of time to be able to hold a room and be able to read a room. And a lot of these newer DJs that maybe just started during, uh, you know, right after 2020 and just picked it up because they're at home and all that stuff and they're just starting now, they don't have that skill set yet and they're getting these shots. And I could see how can, that could be very upsetting to a lot of old, uh, experienced DJs that aren't getting those shots anymore. But 
it's, it's a, a constant cycle, right? If you're doing this because this is how you want to make a living, if you're doing this because this is how you pay your bills, then you are somewhat forced to adapt and forced to bend in the way of the market because that's, you have to do that to be able to survive. <coughs> and again, I'm a total, I'm not, no, I can't say a total purist, but I understand that deep love of the real art of DJing and being able to curate a whole night and build a whole emotional roller coaster and vibe and getting everyone in the room like on your side and just every song you that a DJ can play, you know, every every person in the crowd is loving it. That art of DJing, no matter what it is, if it's technical, if it's just like, you know, playing the right songs at the right time, that that hasn't lost its value to me. But in the eyes of people that are making a lot of the, the decisions in the DJ world as far as booking's concerned, there's a lot of them that just don't have that same appreciation. And I think as DJs, as time goes on, and we have to adapt and add more skills to our toolbox, it can feel like the that pure love of DJing is getting more and more watered down. But I think that's where, like in any industry, right? As times change, the industry changes. It's either you change with it or you pivot in a different direction. I mean, that's why you see a lot of DJs now building their own parties because they're sick of the politics and not having you know, that control of their destiny, where if they start their own party and build it the way they want it and curate it the way they want it, they're able and can build brand equity in that, they're able to call their own shots. You know, it's, <laughs> I guess it breaks down to, you know, either put up or shut up, right? You either change with the industry and you, if you want to be that club, bar, lounge, um, DJ, or you build your own thing and you take the time to really craft and make something special that is a, you know, a reflection of yourself and your taste and your collective's taste or whoever you're rocking with, or you just get out of the game and you go do something else. Um, DJ Twitter is a funny thing, right? Where it's for a lot of... I'll say the majority of DJ Twitter is a bunch of people complaining about nonsense on the internet. Um, from this mixer is for this genre, or you know, this mixer is for another genre, or whatever the argument of the week is, it's so draining. Like, what, why not take that time that it took you to type out all of those tweets and all of those replies? arguing with other people that are doing the exact same thing, why not apply that to doing something productive? Why not, you know, work on your craft, go f dig through some music, go organize some music, go shoot some content, um, or brainstorm and start strategizing your own party. There's really only three things to do, right? It's either you conform to the, the industry, you make your own industry, or four. <laughs> or you complain to people that don't ma really matter, or you shut up and move on to something else. And that can sound harsh, but that's the truth of it, right? Um, I think every DJ has their own journey, um, but to just complain about it and do nothing about it and not take your destiny in your own hands, either by adapting or creating your own, I think, pretty much in the end is a waste of time, right? But more importantly, what do you guys think? I'd love to hear your guys' ideas on this topic. Leave it down in the comments below. Definitely will read everyone and reply to as many as possible. And as always, if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you're looking for more DJ related content, go ahead and click on one of the videos right here and I'll catch you guys in the next one.